Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Penny Stamp Speaker Series. Uh, and thank you all for joining us here at Rackham Auditorium today and making the last minute venue adjustment. Um, this, this whole adjustment was all in service of making sure that we could bring you today's event with a grand piano uh, so as to include some musical performances uh, and, and give you a whole meal deal, which this will afford. As today, we present Grammy and Pulitzer Prize winning composer David Lang. Yes, a uh, big thank you to our partners for their support today. The School of Music, Theater and Dance and its William Balcom Guest Residency Program, which is how we got David here today. Uh, it brings to campus the most prominent and innovative composers and performers in the world, such as David Lang. And we have a little extra support today from the University of Michigan Museum of Art. So just a couple of announcements before we get started. If you like the music on offer here today, there is a free concert tomorrow that you should not miss. This is the Contemporary Directions Ensemble. They will be performing chamber music of David Lang. That's at 8 p.m. tomorrow evening at Harkinson Rehearsal Hall. Uh, many of you may know it, many may not. This is in the School of Music up on North Campus on Bates Drive. If you forget, just look for the School of Music on the website and you'll find it. Uh, and just a couple other announcements. At UMA currently, many of you may already be aware, some of you may not. Uh, UMA is hosting uh, the Roman Witt Artist Residency Project Witness Lab in the Irving Sten Gallery, the glass gallery on the front of the museum, has been turned into a courtroom. Uh, there are many events going on there. Uh, next week, there's actually an event going on there right now. Uh, you should definitely check it out. You want to go there when there are events happening in the, and this space is activated in there. So you can find a list of events uh, on the website. Next week, uh, on Tuesday from 1 to 3, it will be turned into Shakespeare's courtroom uh, with Jillian Eaton and students. And then from 3.30 to 5.30, it will be Breck's Caucasian Chalk Circle courtroom uh, with student directors and actors. Then on Wednesday, we'll once again have Shakespeare's courtroom, more with Jillian Eaton and students. That's from 11 to 2.30 and again from 3 to 5. So, you know, it's not something where you have to necessarily go for the whole time. You can walk in, you can walk out. There are, however, other events later on in the season as the courtroom will be activated through the middle of May that you will want to register for. So you'll want to check out uh, the UMA website for all of the events. Uh, we will not be happening next week. We are going to be going on a two-week hiatus in honor of the winter break. Uh, so you can join us again, though, on March 12th. Uh, we'll be back, and we'll be in our regular home again at the Michigan Theater around the corner uh, with uh, Alex Dagan uh, and a talk in honor of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Uh, we will be having a Q&A here today uh, with David Lang. There are two microphones in the house right there and right there. So when David opens up the floor to your questions, you can go to either microphone that's close and ask away. Do remember to silence your cell phones. Uh, and now for a proper introduction of our guest today, we have the coordinator of the William Balcom Guest Residency Program. Uh, and also, uh, she is, uh, uh, teaches uh, composing up at the music school, Roshan Edizadi. Hello. It's no exaggeration to say that David Lang is one of the most prominent, acclaimed, and performed composers living today. His music has been nominated for Golden Globe. He has won Academy Awards. He has won Grammy Awards. Um, and in 2007, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in Music for his piece, The Little Match Girl Passion, which was performed uh, here at the University of Michigan just uh, two nights ago. His music is rooted in classical tradition, but resists categorization. Earlier this week, David said to our composition students, if you have a really cool idea, it is your obligation as a composer to see how far you can take that idea. Now, he was talking about musical material, motivic ideas, but this project he's about to talk to us uh, about today 
uh, might be an example of a cool idea that he had once and took years to come to fruition. We are excited to hear more about it. And so without any further ado, please welcome David Lang. Thanks for sharing. Okay. Hi. Is this working? Okay, good. Um, thank you. It'll take me a second to get set up here. Um, first of all, what you heard, there are going to be question and answers after this thing is over, so please think of your questions now, because um, it's going to be embarrassing if I just have to answer them myself and there's nothing there. So please start thinking now. I'm going to set up a little bit. Um, there will be some music. We have some great singers who are going to sing some of this music, which I'm going to be talking about. So it's not just me talking. But for a while, it's just going to be me talking. I'm really sorry. Um, also, I have to say, I've never done a PowerPoint before. But I know that this is a really important and august series, and that you all take these things very seriously. So I made a PowerPoint for you. Um, yeah. I'm not very technological, so I hope this works. So the first thing I have to say is, um, this was not the original title of my piece. So when I was asked to talk on this series, I thought, you know, I do lots of different things as a composer, but mostly what I've been concentrating on for the last few years is writing opera. And I was told if I had opera in the title of my lecture, you wouldn't come because you don't like opera. And you know something? I don't like opera either. So, um, so I don't blame you. you know, I have a love-hate relationship with opera, and we're going to get into that. So, um, so I didn't um, have opera in the title, but I did have a subtitle. Um, so Music and Bad Manners um, is actually a book of essays about music by um, by an important American critic from 100 years ago named Carl Van Vechten. So Carl Van Vechten is one of those interesting characters who um, becomes incredibly important in the cultural history of our country and then is sort of forgotten. He was very wealthy, very um, gay, very um, flamboyant. He lived in the high society world of New York, even though he was from Iowa, moved to New York, fell in with all the right people, became very close friends with the, um, the members of the Harlem Renaissance, and he just started writing novels about his life. And the novels are about rich people going to parties, or rich people going to Harlem, or rich people setting up their apartments. They're very fun. They're very gossipy. They're really enjoyable. Um, this book, is a, Music and Bad Manners, is a book he wrote, which is a very gossipy book about music history. So there are gossipy um, things about people getting into trouble doing Wagner operas, you know, gossip about Spanish music. It's just, you know, they're really enjoyable and really fun. Um, he also is important because he is, um, in some circles, considered to be the first American dance critic. He is, was the dance critic for the New York Times, so a um, hundred years ago, he was writing about ballet and about contemporary dance. And he was the person who sort of um, made that into a critical discipline. And then um, after he got tired of being um, gossipy and in society, he became the kind of um, gossipy portrait photographer for all of New York. And so you have actually seen his work many times because many of the famous photographs of our um, cultural heroes from the 20s and 30s are actually his photos. But I only say that because I had to come up with a title that didn't have opera in the title. And now I feel like I can move on. Um, so part of my background is I um, started writing music when I was nine years old. And even though I was doing music all the time and I was writing music all the time, I never assumed that I would be a composer. I went to college. Uh, I was pre-med. I was a chemistry major undergrad. I had huge um, pressure from my family to um, go to medical school, which um, unfortunately never ended. So I remember when I was young, I, um, I got a break and I had a commission from the Cleveland Orchestra and I invited my parents to come and see it because I was so happy that this great thing had happened to me. I was in my mid-20s 
and the piece is over, and uh, my, my parents came and were sitting in the president's box in Severance Hall, and my mother has tears in her eyes, and when my piece is over, she motions for me to lean over so she can say something so personal, and I think, oh, finally, I'm going to get the approval I have always wanted. And she said, oh, there's still time to go to medical school. <laughs> This really happened, right? That was my background. But I believed that. I believed when I was an undergraduate that I was going to go to medical school, and even though I was spending all my time writing music, that music was something that um, I was really interested in, I was really passionate in, but it wasn't going to be my life. And because of that, I think I developed a kind of outsider's mentality to classical music. So for those of you who know something about classical music, you know that we, um, we love and worship and revere the people who have done it hundreds of years ago. You know, we think about Bach, and we think about Beethoven, and we think about Mozart. These are giants who walk the earth, and it's true. They are really great, and that music is really great. But the way we study classical music is very worshipful. We look at that music and we say, these are the giants, and we hope that we are... Um, you know, qualified at some point in our life after years of study to touch the hem of their garment, you know. Um, this is the way we talk about music, and it's really paralyzing for us. So one thing that happened for me is because I always thought of myself as an outsider, I always thought I had the right to look at these traditions of classical music and go, well, why do we do that? Why do we take that for granted? How come this is the way we always do a concert? How come this is the way we talk about that music? Um, this led me to something which um, is a 40-plus year, year project, which is going to culminate, this entire 40 years of my life is going to culminate in you hearing three little arias sung by real singers here tonight. So that's where this whole thing is leading. You're actually going to get some music, but it starts over 40 years ago. I was 21 years old, and I went to see a production of Beethoven's only opera, Fidelio. Does anybody know this opera? You know this opera? Okay, the, the music people know this. For those of you who don't know it, um, Beethoven, one of our great towering geniuses, only wrote one opera, and he was not happy with it, and he rewrote it several times. And this opera is something that in classical music we talk of as being Beethoven's greatest statement of personal freedom. Um, Beethoven took on big ideas. He thought about people's relationship to society. He thought it was his job as a composer to think about the world we lived in and our obligation to each other. And when classical musicians want to think about how we can do that for ourselves, we look at Beethoven as an example of how to do that. He gave us the right to do that. Um, I went into this opera only knowing a couple of beautiful numbers that we talk about. One of them is a beautiful kind of love quartet it's really beautiful and quiet. And one of them is this aria, um, this, this um, chorus that prisoners sing, where prisoners are led into the light, and they sing this beautiful, beautiful chorus about how important it is to be free. And these were the two things that I knew. The opera takes place in a prison, and the story has to do with a woman named Leonora, whose husband has been taken as a political prisoner by the state, by the evil governor, Pizarro. Um, she wants to find out where her husband is and see if she can get close to him and see if she can free him. She dresses like a man, like a boy, actually. She gets a job as the jailer's assistant, and she calls herself Fidelio, faithful. And she gets a job, and she works in this prison for two years, and finally is able to get close enough to the prisoner right as the evil guy, Pizarro, is about to kill him. And somehow, through a completely unbelievable chain of events, she manages to free her husband in a completely unbelievable deus ex machina, which is ridiculous. So. In classical music, we talk about this as being one of our great statements about freedom. So Fidelio is staged in prisons. Um, it's um, talked about as being um, something about a statement of the rights of man. Beethoven wrote this right after the French Revolution, and this idea of freeing a political prisoner is something that came out of people in Europe thinking about what it meant 
to, um, to live in the world where people had overthrown their government. But Beethoven didn't live in that world. Beethoven saw that world, and already by the time he wrote this in 1805, the world had changed. And so this great political message of how important it is to stand up for freedom, how important it is to save the prisoner, by the time Beethoven wrote this story, he couldn't tell that story any longer. This opera was premiered in Vienna when Vienna was occupied by Napoleon's imperial troops. So it's not really a good place to say down with tyranny, you know? Um, so Beethoven had to hide this message. And so his idea of how to hide this message of political prisoners was to hide it in a story of domestic virtue. So he, instead of calling it just Fidelio and the story of you know, politics, he called it Fidelio or conjugal love. And the story becomes not about how to free this prisoner, but about how great it is that this woman wants to go to this great length to save her husband. And this means that there are some really ridiculous things that happen in this opera. At the end of the first act, there's this amazing chorus that I mentioned earlier, the prisoner's chorus, O welche Lust, O what desire. When the people come out and they sing how great it is to be free, it's so powerful and it's so beautiful, and then you never hear from them again. Never. The prisoners completely disappear until that ridiculous moment that I mentioned at the end where there's a little tiny note, not even in the music that anybody sings, just a note in the, in the stage direction saying, oh, and the prisoners are freed. What? <laughs> um, but the other thing which is most frustrating is that because he is hiding this political story in this domestic story, at the end of the opera, when you want the chorus to come out and go down with tyrants, long live freedom, um, instead they sing, happy is the man who has a loving wife. Do you have a loving wife? Sing with us. <laughs> so I remember I was 21 years old, I loved classical music so much. I was such a nerd, right? I, in fact, I still am, you know. Um, and I remember going to see this opera and thinking, wait a second, what happened to the prisoners? Where'd they go? What, this is our great story about freedom. What happened to these people? And then there are weird things in the story where, um, where she asks the jailer, um, have I met all the prisoners here? Like, they're sure, like she hasn't seen her husband in two years, right? I, I, have I met all the prisoners? And he says, oh, there's, there's, there are other prisoners you don't know here, but you must never speak to the prisoners of the state. So her husband is one of the prisoners of the state, but there are others. And at the end of the opera, they, those prisoners are not freed. So this great statement where classical musicians pat themselves on the back for having this great opera about freedom has a lot of unanswered questions. And I remember thinking, there I am, I'm 21 years old, I wonder what happened to these people. You know, somebody should rewrite this piece and just follow the lives of the people who we don't know, right? What happened to those prisoners? We need to pay more attention to prisoners, right? We are over-prisoned. So if this is our big opera, shouldn't it actually deal with that? Shouldn't it actually deal with political freedoms? It's really a letdown to say that people should be married. I mean, I am married also, right? And I love my wife and I think she is great. But I think if I am arrested tomorrow, I really don't think she's gonna be able to free me, but I know she'd want to, but I don't think she's gonna be able to do it, you know? I mean, I'm rooting for her. But I think if we have to depend on all of our freedoms on my wife, I really think we're gonna be in trouble. Um, so I had this idea, I'm gonna rewrite this piece, right? I just thought sometime in the future, I'm gonna get a chance to rewrite this piece. And then I did what young composers do always when they have an idea. They mention it to every single person forever who ever asks them what they wanna do. Um, oh, do you want to do something? Yeah, I'd like to rewrite Fidelio. Oh, we'll call you back, you know? Um, so in the early 90s, I got a phone call from the director of the Santa Fe Opera 
which is a big traditional opera house outdoors in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's a beautiful place. It's a very traditional house. They do very traditional operas, and they do one new opera every year. And um, they called me up, the director called me up and said, um, oh, we want to fly you out, and you know, if we can figure out what the topic is for you to write an opera, we'd love for you to write an opera. So they flew me out. So this is 1992, right? I'm, I fly out to Santa Fe, they go, if we commission you, what would you like to do? And I said, without hesitation, I would like to rewrite Beethoven's opera Fidelio. And they said, well, our audience already knows Fidelio. Why, why would anyone want another one? You know, that's just stupid. So I said, well, in that case, um, I would like to write an opera about the life and times of the Victorian art critic, John Ruskin. And they said, oh, costumes, yeah, you can do that one. <laughs> um, so that's the opera that I did. I did a big grand opera. I took advantage of everything about the least operatic topic known to man, the life and times of John Ruskin, um, who is a much more important figure than Carl Van Vechten, but you get a sense of the kind of people I'm looking for, right? Um, so. I, I took advantage of everything I could do in a traditional opera. I wrote arias, I wrote, I wrote choirs, I had a ballet in the middle because that's something you can do in traditional opera. I had double chorus, I had kids, I had spoken roles. I didn't have any elephants, but, um, but I, you know, if I were doing it again today, I definitely would. Um, and I felt like I did as much as I could to bend towards the opera world and bend towards the tradition of that world. And for some reason, it felt unsatisfying to me. I felt like I had to change so many things of what I did to live in that world that I wasn't able to do the things that I wanted to do in opera. And the biggest problem for me is that for those of you who have seen opera, you know that opera, you, you have characters who are good and characters who are bad. And the characters who are, like, who are good are completely good and the characters who are bad are completely bad. And a happy opera with a happy end is where the characters who are completely good have a really completely good ending. And the characters and, and the operas that are sad or tragic are the operas where the completely bad people, you know, have a really great time ending the opera. You know, I mean, it's like everything has to be wrapped up and everyone has to be understandable and the story has to be kind of, um, uh, cut and dried, right? So there's a kind of cartoony nature to it. And I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people who are basically good. And I know a lot of people who are sort of evil. I only know a couple of people who are really evil and I don't want to put them in an opera, you know? Um, most of my emotional experience in my life goes like this, right? You know, it's not like good, and evil and good wins. It's like, well, sort of good. And that's probably the way I am too, you know? It's like, I'm not as good as I could be, you know? I'm probably not as bad as I could be either, which is good. <laughs> but, um, but so, in, in other words, the way we have built this opera world, we have built a world out of telling stories that um, don't really resemble the lives that we live. Um, and one of the things that's really sad about that is that music has this great power to tell us deep inside who a character is emotionally. And that's why opera is so successful. It's because people love to go, have someone say something, and have the music give you the doorway into their emotional life. So I had this idea after that big gigantic opera that I was going to dedicate my life, or a huge portion of it, to trying to take what I like about opera, which is using the music to be the doorway into character and try to put it in places other than a traditional opera house. And I've spent a huge amount of time doing that and now I'm gonna show you some projects. Um, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna play you any music from the project so don't get too excited, but um, I'm just gonna speed through these as a way of um, hopefully making you um, more interested in hearing the music that you are gonna hear. Um, okay, stripping opera for parts. That's sort of what I think I've been doing. I've been told the next slide is a blank slide. I, I told you, I don't know how to do this, right? That worked, okay. Um, so the first opera I wrote like this after Modern Painters, which was the name of my, um, my John Ruskin opera, 
Um, I, I got a commission to do a project with the Kronos Quartet. And at the time, I was composer in residence at a theater company in San Francisco, the American Conservatory Theater. And so I put the two together and I said, um, let's do this project together. You know, I'm, I'm gonna do a project with the Kronos Quartet on stage and I'm gonna do this opera with theater actors and theater singers and text and one opera singer. And so I did an opera with um, a playwright named Mac Wellman, who's sort of um, legendarily incomprehensible. I love Mac's work, and he did an amazing um, play called The Difficulty of Crossing a Field, based on a story of the same name by Ambrose Bierce. Has anyone read this story? This is an, am an amazing story. So Ambrose Bierce was um, someone, uh, a journalist and writer who went through the Civil War and then moved to San Francisco. Um, and this is a story which is, um, oh, has anyone seen the movie Rashomon, right? And know the story Rashomon about how truth can't be known. So Rashomon was a story written by the Japanese writer Akutagawa, and Akutagawa based his story on a story by Ambrose Bierce. So this idea that, that people have different perspectives and there is no objective truth um, is the core of this writing. And this story is a story that's less than one page long. Um, and in that one page, it manages to tell the same story twice. And the story is a plantation owner in the South before the Civil War walks out into his field and disappears in plain view of everyone and is never seen of again. And everyone has a different explanation of what happened to him. Um, and somehow in that less than one page, it manages to tell this story twice in ways that differ from each other. And so I thought that would make a great opera, The Difficulty of Crossing a Field with Mac Wellman. And that's what it looks like. So you see there's a string quartet down there. I have a pointer, I'm told. See? I'm pointing. This, now I know why people do this. It's really fun. Um, so this is the opera. This is the one opera singer, and the rest are, are theater actors. And there's a string quartet down in the bottom, and um, and here are um, people in the field of the title. Um, so that was really fun, and I thought, okay, this is really mixing things up. You know, I have taken this opera thing. And as I mentioned, opera is something that likes to have definite endings and to know who the people are. And the thing that's beautiful about the theater world is we don't expect that in theater. We are used to going to theater and seeing people's lives depicted that are more like normal people's lives, that don't have resolutions, that don't have good endings, where people are complicated. And so just the act of taking something out of that world and putting it into this other world gave me a huger range of emotions that I could deal with. The next piece was a piece that I did um, with a visual artist named Mark Dion um, called Anatomy Theater. So this was my attempt to do something which would take me out of the theater world entirely. I went to my friend Mark Dion. So Mark Dion is an artist who works with the history of science. And his most um, famous piece was a piece he did for the Venice Biennale where he dredged a canal in Venice and he set up a laboratory on the side of the canal and he had all of his art students assistants in lab coats and everything they dredged out of the canal they cleaned and polished and preserved so they found 16th century glass and coca-cola bottles and used condoms and car parts and everything they scooped out of the canal they treated it exactly the same, they polished it, they preserved it, they cataloged it, and then they built a beautiful vitrine and displayed it all, and this grew over six months. And at the end of the Venice Biennale, the Italian government impounded it because it had you know, 16th century coins and 17th century glass in it. Um, but his work is about how knowledge is acquired and categorized. So I asked him, you know, uh, are there any projects that you have that you weren't able to go as far as you would like to go um, that you think that music could help you with? And he said, well, there is one project. He said that he had had a commission from an anatomy theater, the anatomy theater that's used in the Rembrandt painting, The Dissection of Dr. Culp, 
where there's a, um, a cadaver and there are a bunch of serious looking doctors who are looking at an arm that they're dissecting. And he said he had proposed to those people to do a project in that anatomy theater, in that dissection lounge, to do a historically accurate 16th century dissection. And that he wanted to get a human cadaver for it. And they said, well, our health rules won't allow you to do it. So um, he said that he would do it with the next animal that died at the zoo, and hoping that it would be a camel or a rhinoceros, but instead it was a goat. So he said he was always frustrated that he wasn't able to do that on a real person. And I said, you know, in opera, we can do that. And through the miracle of opera, this person can keep singing. <laughs> so we did this opera anatomy theater. Um, so, and this, all these things with Mark, they're all based on historical documents. So this is a document of a, a woman in the 17th century London who was hanged as a prostitute for killing her husband and children. She confesses her crime. She's hanged, and then we dissect her. Um, and then we talk about the, how the history of science is misogynistic. The history of opera, of course, is misogynistic. You know, without um, cruelty to women, there would be no classic opera. So, um, so this is sort of the subtext of this piece. Um, and so, again, this is an idea of saying, how can you take this idea that music reveals character and put it someplace which is not a traditional opera house? Um, then I did this piece called The Whisper Opera. Um, this was an idea, um, you go to a piece of music and you all want to have the same reaction, right? You see something, I'm on stage, everyone is listening to me, we're going to have singers come up, singers are going to sing, you're all going to hear them at exactly the same time. We're all thinking that we are having the same experience. I started thinking, how could I make an experience where you would not be able to have the same experience as anybody else? Your experience would be unique. And so what I thought was, maybe I could make an opera that was so quiet, where the singer only whispers, where all the music is absolutely, completely, just above audible, and in fact, much of it is inaudible, and that you are seated in such a way that the musicians walk by you, so that you hear a scrap of the story, and, um, and your scrap of the story will be very different from the scrap of the story which is heard by the person next to you. So when you come out of the theater and you go, oh, this was what the opera was about, and they'll say, well, that's not the part of the story that I heard. So I just thought, um, oh, and the really fun thing about this is it says in the score that this opera can't be documented, it can't be recorded, it can't be videoed, it can't be um, shown in any way. So it makes it really hard to book because um, I have nothing to show. But I do have some slides from rehearsal that I can show you. So I did it with the ice ensemble. And it was built in this special way so that you see these gauze areas, right, that separate everyone. People are sitting in these little trenches. And the musicians walk among you. So if you're sitting in this trench, and the singer is here in the middle, you can see the singer. You can hear the flute player, but you can't hear anybody else really very well who are sitting in the other quadrants. And when the singer moves around, there are huge parts of the piece where you hear very little. So um, here's another example of what the troughs are like. So, and I suspended all these bass drums all over the place, so that was um, totally cool. <laughs> um, but again, this is an experience that no one's had. It's certainly not an opera house, but there is a story, and the music reveals character. Um, here is a piece I did called The Loser. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever read this book by Thomas Bernhardt, The Loser. So Thomas Bernhardt is a crazy Austrian writer. Um, and uh, this is an amazing book. When I read this book in the early 90s, um, it's a rant. It's basically one paragraph, which is 200 and something pages long, about a very rich, very smart, very funny, and very broken person. The thing that broke him was that when he was young, he was a good enough concert pianist to be accepted to a master class with Vladimir Horowitz, with the great pianist Horowitz. He's that good. When he gets to the master class, in the class is the young student, Glenn Gould. 
So knowing, even though he's good enough to get into this, so he's obviously excellent, knowing that Glenn Gould will always be better than he was destroyed his life. The loser is his friend who was another student in the class whose life was also ruined for the same reason, reason and his friend has just killed himself. And that's the story. So this man yells for, you know, 200 and something pages about um, how horrible his life is. It's very funny, very dark. I actually couldn't read it sitting down. I went into the bathroom and I yelled it at the top of my lungs into the mirror. It was super fun. Um, and so I had this idea to um, direct this opera myself. There's a scene where the main character, to, oh, and first of all, nothing in this book is true. Glenn Gould did not study from Horowitz. The thing about um, Bernhard is that he wanted to be a musician when he was growing up and he got sick. So there are all these descriptions in the book of Glenn Gould's illnesses, and then years later I found out, oh, wait a sec, those weren't Glenn Gould's illnesses, those were Thomas Bernhard's illnesses. When Bernhard died, he you know, had this love-hate relationship with Austria, and he put in his will that none of his books could be read in Austria, and none of his plays could be produced in Austria. So um, half of this book is saying terrible things about Austria, which I cut from my opera, but... Um, but it's really well worth a read. Um, there's a scene where he describes meeting Glenn Gould for the very first time, and he meets him on the top of a mountain um, where everyone in this town goes to kill themselves. It's, it's called Suicide Mountain, and everyone goes there to throw themselves off. And he talks about how he has often gone up to the top of this mountain, and he goes up there and he sees Glenn Gould, and he, and he says to Glenn Gould, um, uh, both of us are studying with Horowitz. And then he remembers this word for the rest of his life, and Glenn Gould looked at him and he said, yes. It's the most heartbreaking thing in the world. It's so beautiful. So I imagined this piece. Um, it's in an opera house, but I told um, the people in the opera house that I am not selling any seats in the, in the orchestra section. I'm only selling seats in the balcony. So everyone comes up to the balcony, everything down here is completely dark, and there's a little platform on which this man is standing as if he's perched on this mountain about to throw himself off. That's the moment, oh, I directed this opera too, also, so which, um, you know, um, I may or may not have been a good idea, but, um, but this is the moment where he remembers Glenn Gould saying to him, yes. It's the greatest thing that ever happened to him. And here, at the very end of the piece, after he has been yelling at you for um, you know, an hour, um, on stage, floating, elevated, um, a piano appears in the distance, and uh, the virtuoso Conrad Tao comes out and plays this very, very beautiful quiet music in the background that you can't hear because there's this really unhappy guy yelling at you in front. <laughs> um, and that's what it looks like. So there's the balcony up here, and here are the musicians who are hidden underneath. And there he is suspended in air. Um, I'll just say very quickly, this is an opera I got asked by the, um, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum to propose an opera to them. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, um, I, I don't know if you know this in Boston, but it's a, a, a rich person's house an excellent collector, and as part of her will, nothing can be changed in the house. So the problem with this museum is that people go once to see it, and then they never have to go again, basically. So they asked me to propose something that would um, happen, that would mean that um, it would activate the space for return visitors. And I said, you have these five beautiful tapestries in, in your tapestry room, and I'm going to make an opera which is on headphones, um, and it will be um, using each of these tapestries as the set and the character for each scene. And so it will only be available here, it will never be recorded, it will never be available anywhere else, and that way the only place that people can come to see this opera is in your space. So this is what it looked like. So there were these headphones here, and here are the tapestries, these five tapestries about um, King Cyrus of Persia. And the, the idea is you stand in front of them and the music, um, the text written by the playwright Sybil Kempson, um, 
describes what's in there and has a kind of fantastic relationship to what's in the tapestry. The next project I did um, was an opera called The Mile Long Opera. I did this with um, the help of Anne Carson. Shout out to um, Michael Dougherty, who introduced me to Anne Carson. Anne Carson, of course, is a great poet who teaches here. Um, and this um, was something that took many, many years to do. So I, I, I am friendly with the architect um, Elizabeth Diller from Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro. And they had designed the High Line. So you know what the High Line is, right? So it was this completely abandoned railway line that New York wanted to tear down. Um, it got reimagined as a public park and now is the most visited cultural site in New York. It's completely overwhelming. It has also changed the neighborhood completely because originally that neighborhood was the meatpacking district. It was full of um, you know, dirt and crime and prostitution and it was a neighborhood you didn't want to be in after five o'clock at night. And um, now that this has happened on this, um, now that the High Line exists, the neighborhood has completely changed and it is expensive apartment buildings and high rises. And you can see the effect of it as sort of like um, the way sunflowers turn to the light. Everything tried to um, imagine that the High Line was the back. Um, the back of the building faced the High Line. Now everything faces the front of the High Line because that is the, the power of this architecture to change this environment. So um, Liz Diller, I think, felt a little um, strange that this building, this um, um, project had changed the neighborhood so drastically and had um, changed the composition and had chased people out. And so she wanted to do something to look at the change in the neighborhood and she asked me to design a project. So I designed a project with the help of um, Ann Carson and Claudia Rankin, two amazing poet and essayists, um, to do a project about um, people's normal lives in New York. And I thought the whole point of this was so that you would go there, you, you want to be on the High Line, and the High Line is elevated, you have a vision of New York, you should be able to see things. You should be able to take a look, an honest look at things that you haven't been able to see elsewhere. So I went to the poets and I said, um, I'm going to do a piece for a thousand singers that stretch out over the length of the High Line. The audience is going to walk and I want each singer to have an individual aria, an individual melody that they sing, an individual story that they tell. And I don't want to say in the story um, that something good happened to this neighborhood or something bad happened to this neighborhood. I don't want to say gentrification is good or bad. I don't want to say we miss this or we want this or whatever. I just want to say um, let's look at the things that have changed in this neighborhood without, um, you know, kind of neutrally, just to, just to see, just to be able to see. And so I said, can you think of ways to do this that would be neutral? So Anne came up with this really beautiful idea of asking, what does everyone do at seven o'clock? Some people are coming home at seven o'clock. Some people um, are leaving for work at seven o'clock. Some people don't have any place to go at seven o'clock. What happens at seven o'clock? And Claudia's idea was um, she went around and interviewed people um, in the neighborhood and asked them um, to describe their dining tables. So what, what, what kind of dining table do you have? You know, and people would describe their fancy dining tables and their fancy meals and all this, and people would describe, um, here is uh, my table and it's totally full of work and I haven't seen my dining table in years. Here's this thing that says, I used to have a dining table, but um, you know, I, I got divorced and it got taken away. Some people said, I don't have a home, I don't have a table. Um, so it was a way of saying, here's this neutral way of looking at who the people are. And then the people who sang it were community members from every borough of New York. So a thousand singers from every different community, amateur singers, who we rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. So this piece took a long time to put together. Here's what it looked like. So we had people walking on the High Line, and these people are singing individual melodies. I told them... Uh, when someone walks by, it is up to you. You may sing abstractly or you may look people in the eye and sing directly to them. So people the first night, you know, they're community members, they're very nervous, so people were kind of shy about doing it. We ran it for a week. By the end of the week, you know, New Yorkers are hams, right? So every, every singer was looking straight at people in the eye 
and everyone is crying because it's all very emotional and, you know, um, here's what the area, the little, this little underpass looked like. So this was a really amazing project and it was um, super fun. Did anybody see it? I did. <laughs> I, I'm really sorry you didn't see it, it was really fun. Um, okay, so now this brings us to music. We're gonna hear some music. So all of these things came from the fact that I wanted to rewrite Fidelio and I wasn't given the chance and so I ended up doing an opera I didn't like. And now um, I rewrote Fidelio. So I, what I did was I took Beethoven's libretto. There's no Beethoven music in my piece at all. I took his libretto and I cut everything that had to do with the mistaken identity. I cut the secondary love stories. I cut as much as I possibly could. And what I was left was the skeleton of the story of the woman looking for her husband, the jailer who is um, helping to kill the husband, um, and the evil governor, and I added the prisoners back because I thought we're in a prison. I don't want to lose who these prisoners are. You know, we have um, children in cages. We do not want to forget the prisoners. And so, um, so I put the prisoners back in every single scene. I figured out something for them to do. But mostly, I made a list of questions from the original that I hoped would be answered. I didn't want these people to be cartoons, and so I wanted to find out who they were. So I tried to add arias that would tell us a little bit of the background of each. And so we are gonna hear now three arias from this, and maybe I'll set up each one um, individually so that I can shut up and you can hear some music. Um, so the first one we're gonna hear, the way the opera opens, um, this is a little bit of a joke, but you know, some people in classical music know um, that there's a thing, the Leonora uh, um, Overture, right? The Leonora Overtures of Beethoven, right? He wrote four overtures. That's how much he had trouble with this opera. He rewrote it several times, and every time he rewrote it over, um, over 10 years of his life, he wrote another overture. And so now there are all these extra pieces floating around and you may see on a concert program, oh, we're gonna do Leonora number three or Leonora number four. Um, so how the opera starts is actually a big musicological um, you know, craziness. And so I thought, I'm, I'm not even gonna deal with that. I don't wanna have anyone compare what I do at the beginning to the Beethoven, to the Leonora overture. So my piece is gonna begin where it should begin. I'm going to introduce the character of the woman. This woman, um, she has given up her identity. She has given up who she is. She has given up being a woman. She has taken this identity of being a boy and she is hidden for two years just for the right to see if she can find her husband. And so I thought I want to begin by showing you who this woman is, by making her into a real person. And she sings um, an aria that begins the whole opera called um, I Was a Woman. Um, and now, here to sing it for you is Juliet, accompanied by Liz, and please welcome them. And before they sing, because I'm not a professional lecture giver, I messed up. Um, this is what it looked like. This was done with the New York Philharmonic on stage. So this was commissioned by a consortium of orchestras, the New York Philharmonic and seven European orchestras. So it um, just was done in London and it's going on tour through Europe in May. And, um, and what I did is I had the orchestra on stage because prisons are overcrowded. And so I thought we have the orchestra here, here's the conductor, here is the jailer, and the prisoners are present in every single scene. So here's what it looks like, there's barbed wire, um, there's surveillance cameras, it doesn't really locate in the past and it doesn't really locate in the future. Here's what it looks like at the end. Here is um, the boy, right? The assistant, I call him, her. Um, here is the prisoner. Here is the jailer. Here is the governor, the evil head of state. Here are the guards and here are the prisoners. And now, <laughs> here's Julia and Liz. I bet. 
I, I will say all these singers are excellent students here at this excellent music school. That was the slide that was supposed to be up while you were watching that. Um, so I tried to repair everything that I thought was a problem in the original libretto. Um, one of the real problems um, is the character of the jailer because the, the jailer in the original story thinks that Fidelio um, is a man and thinks that Fidelio is gonna grow up to marry his daughter, Marceline. So there's this, like that beautiful quartet that I mentioned, you know, at the beginning about this beautiful music that was from the original. It's about four singers looking at each other and sort of misunderstanding each other. And one of the misunderstandings is Marceline looking at, um, at Fidelio thinking, oh, I'm gonna marry you. So everyone just expects that they're gonna get married, right? So, and I cut that. So the jailer is a problematic character because the jailer is in charge of starving this character and starving all the other characters. The jailer is complicit with the suffering of these prisoners. The jailer draws a line at one minute and says, I'm not gonna kill him, but I'm perfectly happy to take away his bread and water. I'm perfectly happy to have him die under my watch, but I'm not gonna kill him. And one of the things that I remember being shocked about when I saw the opera at the beginning, when I was 21, was that when everyone comes out at the end and they celebrate how great it is to be married, there is the jailer and the jailer's daughter and they're happy and they're celebrating. But 
I thought he was complicit in all of this. You know, so in my version of the opera, I imagine that the jailer is sort of a stand-in for who we are. You know, he's sort of like us. He's trying to figure out where in this world his line is. You know, he's trying to figure out how, um, how broken am I? You know, can I actually, I, I'm definitely helping this corrupt system continue, but I do have a limit. I, I'm in the process of trying to figure out where that limit is. Um, since I cut that love story, um, I had to deal with this particular aria, and it, the next aria was something that I was very tempted to cut, because there is a very clunky aria. Even the greatest Fidelio heads who love this piece this much have trouble with this aria, because Beethoven actually writes a comic aria. Beethoven, not known for his sense of humor, um, writes a comic aria where the jailer is singing to Fidelio and to his daughter about how difficult it's going to be for them when they get married, because they're going to need money. So he's giving them a bit of, you know, like father-in-law advice. Like, you're going to need some money. And it's very funny. The music is very clunky. And it's weird advice, right? He's saying, OK, you want to live in this world? You need some money, right? You're going to need some money. If all you guys have is love, you will always be hungry. It's a very funny aria, and it really, um, I was very tempted to cut it. And then I realized, you know, actually, this is a description of what his worldview is. He's there working as the jailer in this prison, and he's totally happy for money to work there and to help kill this man. That's part of his life. Money must be very important to him. So I repurposed this aria, this, this um, text, by changing it into something that shows his kind of, um, his world wisdom, you know, his, his kind of cynical view about what he is doing there. He knows exactly why he's in that prison. He's getting paid, right? He knows what the value of gold is because you need gold to live. So I changed it from being like fatherly advice to being something that's, um, you know, a little darker. So, um, and now um, here is Alan, who's going to come and sing um, this aria called Gold. world without gold you can't live you can't be happy without gold in this world with gold in your pocket power and love power
chance to live. I get enough. Okay, and now to set up the last one. Um, I, the, after I stripped everything out of the original libretto, and I started trying to figure out who these characters were, I started trying to look for other texts that I could kind of hyperlink to the original text. Things that came up in the story, or in the storytelling, or in the, um, the history, that might actually give us more information about the world that Beethoven was in, what this was about, what freedom actually meant, who these people were. So for example, when the jailer comes out and he sings about um, the jail environment, I actually have a description of where they are, which is from the English philosopher Jeremy Bentham's description of a modern prison, modern being you know, 1795, um, his idea of the panopticon, so there's a whole section on that. Um, I wanted to know who the, who the prisoners were in 1805, right? So I found a list of crimes um, that from 1805 of crimes in London that would get you transported to Australia. And I just set that list. So the, chor the chorus comes out and they sing their, um, their crimes. I stole a loaf of bread. I stole a piece of cloth. I stole a lady's purse. They're all things that would get you transported from an actual list from 1805. And I did this with as many things as I possibly could to learn who these characters were. We never find out what the um, political prisoner's crime was. I thought we should know. So I made him into someone who is a supporter of the French Revolution and his, he sings his text where he sings what he's in, crime, what he's in prison for. He um, sings something which is taken from the social contract of Rousseau. Um, he sings, um, uh, we are born free, but everywhere we are in chains. So um, the most important character here, it turns out the most interesting character um, is the character of the governor who runs this prison, who's imprisoned this man, who's ready to kill him. And um, in my version of this piece, in the original he's just a cartoon evil guy, um, but I, in, in my experience, um, I think the evil people are cleverer than the, than the non-evil people in the world. The evil people seem to have um, figured out how the systems work, and the people who need the systems to work haven't figured it out. And so I wanted in this opera to have um, the evil character actually have a, um, a really comprehensive worldview about how things work. He really knows how the system works. It works for him. He knows how all the decisions are made. You know, They work for him, right? The system doesn't work for anybody else, right? He's the person who knows what's going on. So I really wanted to give him a lot more depth to make it so that he actually sees the world as it is, and he's figured something out. So um, what I did for him after he gives the, um, the instruction that happens in the original libretto for um, the jailer to go downstairs and dig the grave and that he's gonna come back later and kill him, then in mine, he steps out of the action and he looks at the audience and he sings um, an aria which explains um, how he knows how to do this. And this is an aria that's taken from Machiavelli's The Prince, a very famous dictum that he wrote, um, it is better to be feared than to be loved. And one of the things that's so interesting about this, it's just, it's right in the Machiavelli, it just tells you, um, you know, um, love is a bond that men will break if they can gain something by breaking it, but fear, a man who fears you, will never leave your side. Um, so here is um, Daniel to sing, Better to be Feared. Better to be feared than to be loved. It 
It is better to be feared than to be loved. Men are fragile, men are liars, men are cowards, men want money. That brings us to the end of this official part of the lecture. Can you um, please come up so we can all clap? Thank you. That was really great. Thank you. That was really fun. Okay, so um, it seems like we have some questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, would you like to ask a question? Uh, howdy, David. I'm David as well. Um, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm wondering, you seem to work with a lot of prestigious institutions, but you have pretty political messages to your work and kind of out there ideas in terms of staging. How do you kind of balance like the prestige and the rigor of the work that you're trying to produce and the kind of uh, institutions and how uh, they don't like to do new things uh, usually? I think um, yeah, institutions are resistant to doing new things, but they're not against doing new things. So I think, um, <laughs> I think, I think institutions, um, uh, well, look, I'm going to back up and say it like this. Um, most of music history is music written on commission. Mm -hmm. So when we think about music from 800 years ago, it's music commissioned by the church, it's music commissioned by a, um, by a prince, it's music commissioned by a rich person to um, play in the background while rich people are eating dinner. Um, it's music which is made for a specific event that's paid for by somebody else. Those people, and that tradition stays to this day, right? You know, people commission you when you get a commission, an orchestra says, we have 10 minutes for you, here's your slot, this is what's on the rest of the program, this is what we imagine. And 
it's totally fine to do that, right? You know, it's totally fine to answer all those people's needs. But one of the things that I realized very early on is that when someone tells you in a commission what it is they are looking for, they're telling you the end of their imagination. You know, they're telling you, this is what we need, and this is what we can see. And um, if we imagine that what the point of music is for us to express ourselves, why should I expect that these outside people want to express something that's internal to me? They only know their internal needs. They haven't thought of my internal needs. So when somebody asks me what I am interested in doing, I have a policy of asking them if I can do something else. Because I have a long list of things I am hoping to accomplish um, in my life, and I want to do them, right? And so sometimes that means, as in Fidelio, I'm not kidding, I, um, I had so many near misses with this project that were, um, you know, um, with so many different people in so many different environments because I kept talking about it. I have lots of projects like that. So, um, so I think, you know, we, we, the institutions get a bad rap um, because I, I think we think of them as being limited, but I think what they do when they ask you for a commission is they're telling you their need. They're telling you this is what we imagine our need is. But you can actually um, tell them what your need is, and then maybe you can um, make some sort of compromise. Mm -hmm. The thing which I think is also very interesting, I did this when somebody came to me and said, I, I want a 10-minute piece from you. And I said, oh, that's so interesting that you want a 10-minute piece from me, and I'm really flattered. But the piece I want to write is um, an hour long for an orchestra with a chorus and all this. And you know, here's what it does, and this is why I want to do it. And the guy like gulped. And then he said, uh, OK, you're talking into it. You can do it. You know? And um, what happened at that moment was he went from being the commissioner of the piece to being my partner. Mm. And, um, and so I knew at that moment that I had um, changed a business relationship into a friend. And the worst that could have happened was he could have said, no, I want the 10-minute piece. And then I would have said, OK, fine. I'll write you a 10-minute piece. He still could have been my friend, writing a 10-minute right. piece. But you know what I mean? I think we, we think that, um, that the opportunities that come to us um, are things external to us. But the most important thing is for us to know what it is that we want to do, to know who we are, to know what's important to you, to know what drives you. you know? and, and I think what happens is as you get more established and people trust you, they'll go farther with you. But I also think as you um, can say things that are important to you um, with passion, um, as you become more passionate, other people have the option of becoming more passionate with you. And that's how you know who your friends are. Thank that's you. my answer. Yes? Hey, David. Um, my name is Marcus. I, uh, I should preface my question by saying that I never went to music school or art school, and so I'm only peripherally aware of what I'm about to ask about. Um, so in the beginning of your talk, you were talking about the way in which, uh, let's say, the music establishment or the music education establishment tends to revere um, the great composers of the past. And... Um, it is my perception that it seems that the music establishment tends to lean towards reverence of tradition, whereas the fine arts establishments tend to lean towards uh, reverence of novelty. And sometimes it almost feels as if, you know, there's a new, a new common era that maybe starts with like Duchamp or something, or like the Impressionist, I don't know. Um, so I'm wondering if A, you think this is, if you, if, this, if you believe this is accurate, and B, uh, how did things get that way? And C, where does that like, divergence in two different art forms, or the establishment of these art forms, where does that lead to? Thank you. Question. Um, the, um, you know, there's, there's good um, work in every discipline that reveres the past, and bad work that reveres the past. And there's good novelty in every world and bad novelty in every world. But what I think happens in the visual arts, which is really interesting, is that um, the arts um, have an idea um, that it is okay for you to see something that you don't like and you can walk past it. 
because it doesn't um, affect the amount of time that you have to spend with it. I think music has a special problem because you can feel like you are um, captive for something. If you see something for an hour that's terrible, um, you feel like um, that hour really hurt. I wasted that hour. I lost that hour. If you go into an art museum and you see something you don't like, you walk by it. It takes three seconds, you know. So I think the, the delivery mechanism is actually um, um, kind of affects how we think about those worlds. So one of the things which is different than I think about visual art is that if you have something novel, it can change that three seconds into 10 seconds, and that's a successful piece. Um, but the other thing which is really interesting about the visual art world is because it's um, a little more immune to um, having people um, you know, feel like they are ca made captive in some place, that it means then that, um, that something which is offensive or um, aggressive or something which is controversial, um, people then in the audience can decide um, for themselves how close or how far away from that experience they want to get. And that means it can become a place that's actually a little better home for risk. So in classical music, it's a lot harder to risk these things because in order for me to do one of these ridiculous projects, I have to get everyone to agree that you want to spend you know, two hours doing it. Um, and people who don't like it after 10 minutes, you know, um, you're going to be really unhappy after two hours. I'm really sorry. Whereas people line up at the Whitney Biennial every year. Um, you know, they line up outside to go inside and have a terrible time you know, seeing all this confrontational work. And then they talk to their friends about how confrontational it was. And then they go line up again to see it again. You know? um, we get used to the idea that risk is part of that world. And then risk becomes a value in that world. We, in classical music, we, um, we don't think about risk that way. We don't study the risk that way. We study the masters. So. Um, what we revere in music is something that reminds us of a lot of the music that we already know. So, um, so that's, I think, a problem. You know? I think if you um, want, I run this music festival in New York called Bang on a Can, and one of the things about Bang on a Can is we try to have things on, on that you don't know, right? Because um, there should be something which is um, unknown to you and which is hard to listen to and which is difficult. And, you know, and, and if we can educate our audience and give them a, a great enough time and a more relaxed experience, then people will get used to the idea, I'm going to go to that thing because I hear things I don't know. I don't think that, um, that um, things in opera or orchestra are, um, are, are organized that way. They could be. I think they could be. But I think there's money, and I think there's conservatism, and there's weirdness, and you know, I mean, there are all sorts of other things that force our field to be more conservative than it has to be. You know, music instruments, the you know, the players at the school are amazing, and they are better educated than any musician that played in Beethoven's lifetime. You know, and they can do anything. But we're teaching them to do what they did in Beethoven's lifetime. You know, they can do anything, right? So we should teach them how to do that, too. And I know that a lot of that is happening here at this school. I know they're very flexible. But I think the audience teaching is, is a different kind of thing. You know, when you go to an orchestra and here are two pieces that you know and one new piece, um, it's nice that they're doing one piece. But what they're actually telling you is, we're going to slip this thing in, and you're really here to the, here the fam famous soloist or hear something else. You know? We're not really creating um, the, the sense that an audience is going for risk. So. And I think there's a lot of reasons why. I mean, one of them is just the economics of it. You know, it's like orchestras sell by subscription. So that means we have to figure out how to make a season that looks really good that the largest number of people who have different backgrounds will pay for. So it was a great thing that happened in New York um, a few years ago that I just thought was really interesting. And then this is sort of like the end of the question. But um, the New York Philharmonic decided to stage an opera by this um, you know, really great 20th century composer, Georges Ligeti. It's this kind of, um, kind of um, uh, absurd opera called Le Grand Macabre. And it's wild, and it's you know, really complicated and incredible. And they decided to stage it this, kind of roughly the same way they staged my opera. right? So the orchestra on stage and things happening around. And, um, and it was on their subscription season. And all the subscribers to the Philharmonic turned their tickets back in because they thought, well, 
oh, we don't want to see this piece, right? You know, it's a contemporary piece. It's two hours long. It's really difficult. I don't know the composer. I don't know the music. They turn their tickets back in and drove. So there was an article in the New York Times about how this was like the biggest disaster, you know, of the season. Um, the New York Philharmonic then did something really interesting. They marketed that concert individually. You know, normally they market a season. They go, here's our season, and you can pick 10 of these concerts, or you can pick five of these concerts, or pick the whole season. But they decided, you know, there's an, there's an audience just for this one piece. And we're going to market to that one piece. And it ended up being completely sold out, the hottest ticket in town. It was amazing performance. And it was there with people who were there specifically to see that. And I would say um, that's the way Mozart should be packaged as well. That's the way a really great soloist should be packaged as well, which is you have, um, you know, um, Augustine Hadelik coming to play the, the Beethoven Violin Concerto, and that should be the show, and we should market it so that everyone who wants to see that piece comes to see it, you know? Um, but we've built a kind of financial structure around it that keeps the risk out because the risk makes it hard to sell tickets. So. Um, all these things kind of affect the world that you are in. I will say one other stupid thing before about this, which I just think is really interesting. So my kids, I wanted them to have music lessons, right? I didn't push them, but I wanted them to have music lessons. And I remember when my oldest kid, you know, was like five, and he came back from piano lessons, and he was playing like this, um, you know, little piece of, of Bach, and they're trying to teach him how to wiggle his fingers. And I just looked at it and I went, so you're getting these two messages at the same time, and you're, this is like, like propaganda. You know, you're getting, here is the technical thing about how you move your fingers, and here's the message to worship at the shrine of the master, you know. Can you actually give people music lessons and not teach them how to do that? You know, I mean, maybe that would be interesting. Like, let's wiggle your fingers, and let's learn everything you can do with your fingers without telling you what music is good. What would you do? You know, maybe you would make a different kind of music. But that's the way we teach classical music. Anyway, thanks for the question. Thank you, and thanks for being here. Hi, David. Thanks so much for coming. My name is Corinne Gardner. I'm a Michigan graduate from the architecture school. So I was familiar with the Mile Long Opera, the Mile Long Opera from the Diller and Scafidio portfolio. And so I just wonder if you will replicate the Mile Long singing again. And if so, um, will you be looking for designers to participate? Um, yeah, so the Mile Long Opera, it, it was super fun to do. and it, it took six years to put it together, and we rehearsed it for a, you know like a year, and it was done with um, all these incredible people from New York. It was really great. It was totally fun. And as soon as it was over, we started getting offers from uh, you know Los Angeles. Somebody wanted to produce it in the LA River. Um, we got an offer from the Kennedy Center. We got an offer from Paris. We got an offer from London. I've been really discouraging those because I feel like this was a piece about New York. And I feel like, why do people in Paris want to listen to people sing about New York? You know, like, it has no, the, the thing that was of value to me about this piece was that um, because it was made up of community members from all across the city, they're you're looking at people and hearing their story and having a personal connection with people that you usually um, don't come in contact with. And, um, and that was really emotional and it was really powerful. And I don't know anybody in Paris. You know? why, why would I want to have that experience with those people? You know? I'm sure it would be really fun. I mean, it's always fun to go to Paris. That's really fun, right? But it just seemed like it would lose its meaning. So what I'm really hoping will happen is that we'll, it, it, it can become presented again on the High Line in New York, and maybe it can become like an annual or a semi-annual event or something, and, or biannual or whatever. Um, and maybe um, you know, that way people can experience it. It was, um, it was hugely expensive to do, and the major funder was Target. And one of the things that they funded was they funded a robot with a video and a, and a microphone going up the entire length, all mile and a half of the, of the High Line. So if you go, there is a website where you can go, like if you go to milelongopera.org or whatever, I, I think that's the website. Um, you can actually follow this, this robot. You can turn the camera and see the different singers. And it's, it's very, um, hmm. 
uh, you know, there, there's no audience there, so, um, so it's, um, it's not really the accurate experience because you don't have to bump into people, but, um, but that's sort of the future of it. You know, I mean, I think also, I had this experience really early on. Um, I wrote a percussion solo when I was really young called the Anvil Chorus that, you know, has probably had like 10,000 performances. You know, it's like most solo percussionists in the world play it. And I remember thinking, um, I have this piece, it's really practical, everyone can play it, it's really great, I'm really happy everyone plays it. Then I got another commission for another percussion piece, and I thought, well, what's my job? Am I supposed to do another piece that everybody can play? And I thought, no, I've done that. I, I have a piece that everybody can play. Now I can do a piece that nobody can play. You know, now I can do a piece that's weird. You know, now that takes the pressure off me. I don't have to do that every time, you know. So I kind of like pieces like the Whisper Opera or like the Mile Long Opera, which, um, you know, really is located in one place, or like True Pearl, which is only in the Gardner Museum and is only going to be up once a year. You know, I like the idea that um, I have some pieces that I want everyone in the world to do, and I have some pieces that I'm totally fine being, um, you know, little hidden secrets, and, um, and that's okay. Very cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, did your parents ever really accept um, that you wanted to be a mu musician? Did my parents ever what? Accept. Oh, accept? Um, the reason why I'm going like this is because the speakers are out here. So on stage, actually, you know, like all the sound is pointed back that way, so that's why I look weird. Um, so unfortunately, my mother passed away before I made a living as a composer. So, but I will say one of the great things about the Pulitzer Prize and going to the Oscars and things like this is it made my father finally relax and realize that I was going to be okay, you know. So um, that's what those things are really good for. So, um, and after that, my relationship with my father has been spectacular. So, um, but now I have kids of my own, and I feel like I want to go back to those years and apologize to my children, because all parents really want is for their children to be taken care of and to be successful and to not have a hard life. And the truth is, being a musician is a risk. It's a very hard life. So what my parents were telling me was, um, um, you know, we really just want the best for you. And, um, and my children um, are, are um, unfortunately in fields where none of them will ever make a living. So they've learned the lesson. I mean, what could I tell them, right? You know, how could I tell them, oh yes, this thing which will, my, my son writes poetry, right? You know, probably the, you know, the only field which is worse than being a composer. Um, and I have to tell them, yes, I support you completely. I, I, I'm completely on your side. But I worry about them the way my parents worry about me. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm, from, I'm a student from the Stamp School of Art, and I wanted to ask how, since you talked about how in, the school, in your school of music that they basically like worship Bach and Beethoven and all of those things, have you ever felt like, creatively limited by those expressions? And if you did it, how did you like work around that or sort of like build upon what they already did in order to like be more expressive? I think all of this is about the creative limitation. I think all of this, um, you know, I, I feel like I got something out of my many years of study of classical music and I, and I feel like um, I know the inner workings of all of this stuff really well, and I'm a college professor, I have a doctorate, and I you know, teach at Yale, and, and so I feel like um, I'm very close to it, and so I see why it's seductive, and I see why um, it's attractive, but I also just see other things it could do, you know? and I, I do think that that's the creative limitation. I'm not, I'm not at all for, um, for blowing everything up, you know, and in fact, the way I'm really hoping this piece will happen, my, my Fidelio opera, and some opera companies are actually um, talking to me about this right now, which is that they're going to run the pieces next to each other. I made my piece very practical, so it's exactly the same instrumentation as the Beethoven. So if you, have, if you are doing the Beethoven, you can do my piece the next night. And so I really want to be in dialogue with the classical music, and I really depend on people um, 
uh, being engaged with the classical music. So I don't think that what I'm doing is trying to like, go off in a different direction. I think I'm really trying to find um, another way for people to get into how great the original is. You know, I think the weird thing, when you grow up in classical music, you're always explaining to your friends why that's a good thing to do. Like, you know, you grow up and, and you say, oh, I do classical music, and everybody goes, why are you doing that? You know, there's pop music, that's so great. There's jazz, that's so great. Why are you doing this, right? You know, what's that, you know, stupid thing you're doing, right? And so I think, um, at least for me, I always felt like I had a lot of explaining to do to my friends who were artists or theater people or people in other disciplines. And you'd have to say, um, no, it's, uh, you know, like I remember when I was a kid and I would say, I, I, I want to, you know, be a musician. And they go, oh, like the talking heads? You know, no, not like the talking heads, like something else, you know. Um, so there's something about it that's kind of fundamentally uncool. And I feel like if I can give one ounce of coolness back to it, um, then I won't feel like such a nerd, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, Thank I you. What you're saying. Hi, David. I'm a big fan of yours. I've been following you for a couple decades. Um, just wanted to let you know that um, I was curious about if it's possible, if you could explain the beginning of Bang on a Can to where you are now in a very short amount of time. So, um, yeah, so this organization, Bang on a Can, was started with um, two friends, Michael Gordon and Julia Wolf, who are both excellent composers, and we met in school. And um, basically, we would meet every single day in New York. We were young composers. We had nothing to do. You know, young composers sit around. You're underemployed. Nobody plays your music. Nobody plays the music you want to hear. And we just would meet every day, and we would just complain. You know, and after a year of this, we just went, this is really boring, you know? Like, either we do something about this world. So we literally sat down and we made a list of all the things that we thought needed to be changed in order to make a healthy environment for contemporary music. Um, music, uh, you know, famous people and unfamous people should be equal. All music, you know, like, should not be categorized by classical music or jazz or opera or whatever. It could be categorized differently. So we thought maybe you could categorize it by being who in whatever kind of music they're doing wakes up in the morning and goes, am I an innovator or am I conservative? And maybe if we put a concert together of people who all imagine they're innovating in their discipline, we wouldn't go to a concert and feel like, oh, this kind of music is better than that kind of music. We'd go in and, and we would go, God, there are a lot of really interesting people doing a lot of weird things. So we start, we just thought, we're, we, we're gonna, we just went through this list and we thought we're gonna make a 12 hour concert. So we did the very first year, we did a 12 hour concert. We thought one of the problems with concerts is you see a concert, there are four pieces on the concert. This is what happens in contemporary music. And then you go out with your friends to the bar afterwards and you all agree, okay, this piece is better, this piece was worse, this piece was terrible, that composer must be awful. We all agree this composer is the best, right? So you, you come to consensus, whether you agree or not. You know, you're actually losing your own independent voice by coming to consensus that way. So we thought, you know, because music is really personal, why should you like what anybody else likes? You know? um, so we thought, we're going to have a concert that's 12 hours long, and then you'll go to the bar afterwards and you go, my favorite piece was this, and your best friend will say, oh, I didn't see that, I was going out for dinner. Um, and so you know, we did this thing, it was super fun, we had a really great time. And we thought we're gonna do this thing once. We did it in an art museum, in an art gallery in Soho in New York because we thought, um, you know, music audiences already know what audience they're, what kind of music they like. We're gonna do it for an art audience. Um, we'll just do it this one time. So the concert sold out and, you know, we went from two in the afternoon to two in the morning and then, you know, we, sold the tickets and sold the beer and cleaned up. And so like four o'clock in the morning, we're still sweeping up. And then we looked at each other and we went, you know, we have to do this. You know, we, there, we, we have to do it again. So we've tried to continue growing and we have started doing, you know, over the years, we've been going now for 33 years. And we um, have done festivals all around the world. We have an ensemble called the Bang on a Can All Stars. We have a marching band called Asphalt Orchestra. 
We have a commissioning program called the People's Commissioning Fund where our audience pools five or ten dollars and we commission weirdos. Um, we um, have an opera production company. We have a summer school which, where we have um, 40 young composers and performers from all around the world who come to Mass Mocha in, Ma in the Berkshires in Massachusetts and they work with people who have dedicated their life to weird music. And, um, so we do as many things as we can. And we have just started something now for the very first time, a new project, which is in New York, May 1st through 3rd, if anyone is available and has nothing better to do. We, have, we are starting a new festival, which is called Long Play. And we have over 50 events in venues in Brooklyn, in Brooklyn which are within walking distance of each other. So we have the Art Ensemble of Chicago, we have a giant Steve Reich concert where all of his multiple pieces that are done on tape usually are all going to be done completely live. So electric counterpoint with 14 guitars. Um, we have um, thousands of musicians participating and we have free events, we have community events, education events. We're doing as many things as we possibly can called long play. So if you're around, check it out. So basically, Michael and Julie and I are still best friends, and we live very close to each other. We see each other all the time, and, um, and we don't really get paid, right? You know, um, so we have an organization now that does all the work, and we are essentially still volunteers. So our feeling is um, we are in it for the passion, and so if we can think of something that we need to do that the music world would enjoy, um, we're going to do it. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. You're a big inspiration. Just want Thank to say you. that. Thank you so much. We were, uh, my wife and I went to your show at UMA on Tuesday night, uh -huh. and I really liked the excerpts from Enemy of the State this afternoon. My question is, do you envision your music as standalone and not staged? Uh, what brought that to mind is last summer at Tanglewood, the Boston Symphony performed Devocery in concert and it really focused your attention on the music and the intricacies of the music because you didn't have spectacle on stage to watch. Would your music have a standalone value like that? I have a lot of instrumental music and actually there's gonna be some of it tomorrow and a lot of music which just exists on a stage. But I sort of got captured by theatrical music and, um, and I started thinking that even the music which is on stage where you are not watching anything in particular that's been added to it, that it is of great value to watch it. That knowing that somebody is in front of you doing something is itself a theatrical gesture, even if they are not doing something that's expressly theatrical. And one of the reasons why I think this is because um, a, a lot of music that's around now is recorded. You know, most of our experience with music is recorded. So most of the music that we hear in our life is mediated by electronics or by a record industry or by a car or you hear in an elevator or you hear somebody's, you know, um, iPod walking by you or whatever, you know. Um, most music is, um, is already recorded. And so for me, the real value of music that is live is that you see it happening in front of you, is that you're in the presence of something, and there must be some value to being in the presence of it happening in front of you if we are going to protect live performance. And protecting live, I, I think recorded music is great, but I think live performance is the, is the key to all music. So, I, I mean, I have students who grew up with electronic music and, you know, with their music, you know, as um, a pop form, and they, their music is completely unlive. It can't be done live. I am not like that. I'm very old fashioned, and I think musicians in front of you, you know, are the key to um, every musical culture, you know. But how do you make it so then we choose this event over choosing sitting at home and listening to it, right? What is, what is it we get? out of going to a live performance. So one thing you can do is to add a theatrical element that you pay attention to. One thing you can do is to say something like the Whisper Opera where there's um, something which can only happen live because it's been forbidden to be um, recorded because recording um, can't capture the full experience. Another thing that's really important is the experience in the audience, right? So that's something you don't get at home. 
you get a personal experience listening to music that's recorded at home. What you get here is you get the community, right? You get the, um, the kind of churchy, the religious part of it, you know, which is that you get the community of listeners who are listening to something who, whose attention you can feel, right? So you can design pieces that actually make it so that the attention of the audience is the thing that you are paying attention to when you are listening, and that adds to the value of the live performance. Um, so that's sort of what I've been trying to think of. You know, so even my pieces, which are not um, uh, explicitly theatrical, know that you are looking at them. And the reason why I do it is because, um, is because you are absolutely right. That experience is amazing, and that experience is in danger of being lost. And so we have to figure out ways to make sure that um, that, that experience is refreshed and that that experience is, um, is ennobled. And um, on that note, thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>